but we'll go ahead and get started straight into our first uh, presenter, Brigadier General Ayers. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Ayers. I am an Army JAG, and many people have asked me about my white shirt and now this blue jacket. Um, and, and many people, in particularly our, our foreign countries, all thought I was in the Navy. Um, I, it, it was here at the Naval War College, I was not trying to invite confidence, although some have accused me of perfidy, but Yoram, I know that wearing a uniform cannot be perfidy. That would be uh, <laughs> another violation, uh, and there's still some question about the emblems and insignia. We, we have all that. Um, so, uh, but uh, I, I do want to say that I am speaking on my personal behalf. I think. Uh, invited here uh, mostly because of my recent experiences uh, as the chief operational lawyer in Iraq uh, from 2008 at the end of the surge, uh, the height of the surge through the end of the surge, through the uh, 2009 and the expiration of the UN Security Council resolution and uh, the transfer of responsibility uh, fully to the government of Iraq. Um, but I also have, have published uh, in 2004 after after my experiences in detention operations in both Afghanistan and Iraq in a, in a parameters article. Uh, and that, you know, I know many of you publish or perish, that was published as catharsis for me uh, after my experiences there. So, um, you know, and we can talk about early detention operations in the United States if you'd like to in the question and answer period. But as Bill and I just uh, spoke, you know, Harold Coe just went over um, about 20 min minutes on detention policy, and Bill is here, so I, I don't really want to talk about detention policy as much as I do about uh, some practical aspects of detention operations in the NIAC. And a grand entrance by Ken Watkin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I'll note that as uh, Professor Garraway said yesterday, it's extremely dangerous when one country drives the interpretation of international humanitarian law. I would say it's also extremely dangerous when, um, n when academicians and others look to the practice of one country to define state practice. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk to some of the things that we do, um, and I think there are many who are looking at our operations in Iraq, and particularly now in Afghanistan, and saying this defines state practice. And, and I thought the panel this morning was wonderful to look at some other things. Lieutenant General Farrar, thank you for still being here for your presentation um, and, and the operations in Colombia and, and the things that uh, Australia are doing around the world. So um, I am presenting some examples, some practical examples, but I, I realize that it, it, it should not define state practice and nor would I want it to be seen as defining state practice because uh, we sometimes do things in a different way. And the last thing I'd say by way of, of introduction is that I, as, as we do talk about policy, I am very proud of the long history of the United States Army uh, JAG Corps and all of our JAG Corps, uh, the Navy JAG Corps, and it's an honor for me to be here, be, to be part of that tradition of um, adherence to uh, IHL, and particularly adherence to uh, and is a desire to follow common Article Three in all of our conflicts uh, when it comes to detention operations. And again, I can uh, talk about that. Now, when, when I first uh, got into the, uh, the role of advising commanders about detention operations um, in, in a NIAC, uh, what I thought about was, well, what is the purpose of detention? You know, obviously, what is the legal authority? And we, we talked about that, long recognized our authority in a NIAC um, to detain, to keep people out of hostilities. But when you look at, um, for instance, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, when we are going to argue a, a sentence for a soldier who's committed a crime, we talk about four purposes uh, in that context, in that scenario, uh, for detention. Um, there is obviously this specific deterrence, uh, similar to keeping uh, somebody out of hostilities, specific deterrence to keep someone from committing a crime in the future. There is general deterrence, as you argue for a sentence, that you'll send a message. There is um, the possibility of uh, just a sense of justice and retribution for the victims. Uh, and then there is also uh, a sense of rehabilitation, that the, the person who committed the crime themselves through some time uh, while detained would be rehabilitated. Now obviously, none of those, uh, those last three would be a proper reason for detaining somebody in a NIAC, uh, and a force that is there to, um, 
to maintain order in a country. But as you, I think they're, they're good for us to think about because one of the things the United States was doing, we're you know, looking at not only the purpose why we detain people, what, but what is the purpose of our mission? And so um, as I look back on my Iraq experiences, I am, and I think about the purpose of our mission there, I'm reminded of a, of a quote recently attributed to a lieutenant about his, the operations in Afghanistan. And the lieutenant said, actually, we are the insurgents, and we are trying to sell a government that is corrupt and feeble and does not have much reach beyond Bagram, um, which, which is, is very true in many ways. But it was also very true of the government in Iraq in, in early days of Iraq. And so um, what you're trying to do in as an international force, part of the coalition forces in Iraq, what we were trying to do was trying to sell that central government uh, and trying to build up that central government so it would not be corrupt, so it would not be feeble, so it would have a reach beyond Baghdad. And as you know, um, in any of these counterinsurgencies, uh, you want one, one force, one government, uh, a government to be the sole arbiter of power, the sole user of power, um, and have a monopoly on the use of force and, and only be able to use that force and detain people after some, uh, some judicial process, obviously. And, and so that is the end state of the counterinsurgency force. And so as you're trying to think about how do we get there, y you have to think about then setting up, putting the government in a position where it can do that, where it has that monopoly of uh, the use of force and it has these systems in place. So you have these, these two uh, desired goals and then let's look at the other side. What do you have in terms of people who are trying to get, keep you from getting to those uh, desired end states? Um, and and we, we came across uh, a number of uh, insurgents in, in I would say a couple of categories. Let's take for instance Early on in 2004, we had a, um, a guy who would go down and he would blow up the large electrical towers. And his purpose in blowing up the large electrical towers was a criminal purpose. His purpose in blowing up the large electrical towers was to you know, be able to steal some of the metal and to um, sell that metal for scrap. So purely a criminal purpose. But another person who blown up a similar electric tower his purpose might be um, because he doesn't want the coalition forces there. He's trying to show that the coalition forces uh, could not guarantee uh, security and safety in, in Iraq. Um, there, there might be another person there, though, that blows up those same electrical, electrical towers because he, is, he does not like the, the elected government of Iraq, doesn't like the way it's being formed, wants a, a greater Sunni voice or a greater Kurdish voice or a greater Shia voice. Uh, or whatever, so it's an anti-government of Iraq purpose in blowing up that uh, electrical tower. And then there might be a fourth uh, person there blowing up that electrical tower, and that fourth person, um, it may be a foreign fighter uh, that was brought in uh, by Al-Qaeda that was there uh, solely on a training mission, or solely to do something that would be uh, some future operation in Iraq or against U.S. forces or against uh, actually the United States um, and any of our national interests to include uh, in the continental United States. So I th say you'd have kind of those four types of persons who uh, coalition forces might detain um, in, in their operations. Now, in, in the first instance, the criminal uh, case, that's, it should be very simple. What you should be able to do with someone who does it for criminal purposes, you're going to turn them over to the government of Iraq to uh, a constituted court, and they can deal with that under their criminal laws. Uh, and uh, in 2008, that was somewhat easy. In 2004, much more difficult because uh, there's threats against the judiciary. And, and of course, anyone in, in that society, um, they're connected to a family, they're tr connected to a tribe, they're connected to a clan. And so judges, while they might be willing to, to uh, bring forward a case against one person, when they start thinking about this person connected to many different uh, members of the society, uh, start to get hesitant 
about moving forward on criminal cases until they're very sure of their own security. And so that was one of the, the first things we were working on in, um, in trying to get the, the government to back on its feet and to be uh, more of a mature government with all of the functions of a government. So um, that, that would be one aspect. The next aspect, I would say, is that you have the government of Iraq forces, um, Iraqi security forces, both the army and the police, and again, very early on, very immature, very unable to do that. Uh, by 2008, when I came back to Iraq, um, you had what we talked about earlier, you had partnering of units, and you had uh, American soldiers um, with Iraqi police units, American soldiers uh, with uh, Iraqi army units, and trying to teach them about, uh, first, the rules of law, um, and also, though, trying to have them look forward to a day when they would be using the courts. And so um, it was very interesting to see that a, a private in the Army who just spent a lot of time watching Law and & Order and NYPD Blue or other things like that had a better idea of teaching an Iraqi Army unit about gathering evidence, for instance. You know, just take some pictures. Uh, gather the evidence, go talk to some people, try to figure out what happened, um, knowing that eventually these cases would be transitioned to a, a criminal um, concept, even if you could hold them, detain them for security purposes uh, until the expiration of, of 2008 and the expiration of the UN Security Council resolution. So um, that, was, that was really being done in earnest throughout 2008 to try to uh, partner with Iraqi security forces and, and teach them how to um, gather evidence and use forensics and, and things of that, that matter. Now, likewise, in 2008, uh, coalition forces, um, which in the beginning of 2008, there were about 26 nations, and of course, by the end of 2008, uh, we got down to uh, just the UK, who were, was able to negotiate a separate agreement with the government of Iraq. So slowly, the number of coalition partners in 2008 kept dropping out um, and to, it was just two countries there as of uh, the expiration of the UN Security Council resolution. Both of those nations in 2009, uh, they're um, under a, an agreement at the invitation of the host nation. So th as throughout 2008, increasingly it became uh, US forces and UK forces then uh, doing the teaching. But also, uh, U.S. forces um, in, the, in the beginning of 2008 had a, upwards of uh, 25,000 detainees. Uh, the government of Iraq forces had upwards of 25,000 detainees of their own um, who were being held not necessarily on a criminal basis, but again, under this uh, rubric of hostilities and, and keeping them from further hostilities. Now, you might think the 25,000 is, is quite a few, and it is quite a few uh, numbers, but um, I just, by way of example, the town of Ramadi, where I, where I was in 2004, we always thought uh, then that a town of 500,000, uh, the town of Ramadi, there was probably about 5% of the people who were dead set against us and would put their lives at risk to, to uh, fight against us. Probably about 10% that leaned that way, and then there was about 5% of the people who would put their lives at risk to move forward to a new Iraq, and about 10% of the people who would lean that way, and so then you'd have a good 70% in the middle who just wanted to get along in life. But when you got 5% of the people who were are dead set against you, willing to put their lives at risk uh, to, to die trying to get you out of the country, 5% of a town of 500,000 is 25,000 people. So, um, you know, in terms of the numbers of people that could be detained, you're talking about quite a few. So again, at its height in, in uh, 2008, which we quickly started to move down from about 25,000 detained by U.S. forces. Now, as you detain these, um, these folks, what you quickly realize, even when you've, when you've got about 25,000 uh, people um, who you're detaining, um, the number of incidents in Iraq, you were still, you had to figure out some way to ensure that only the worst are the worst. I mean, we just were overcome in terms of, again, the numbers that I just went through, you're not gonna be able to uh, detain everybody 
with the level of the insurgency it was, you weren't going to detain everybody who committed acts against you and, um, or everyone that you suspected or everyone that um, was in some way a security concern to U.S. forces. And so it was uh, very true that um, where, you know, you know you, if you were able to come up with a, a, sp a house where an IED uh, was, the, all the evidence led to one house, and in that house there were five males uh, living in that house. Um, you could detain all five males. They were probably all under a, um, a principal theory. They're always guilty. But then eventually um, you're, you're going to have to have some evidence that's going to lead to uh, one of those males who was most complicit. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the act of the IED. If, if you didn't have, you know, unless you had good evidence against all of them. And so, uh, and that would primarily happen quite a bit. And so you'd, you'd arrest five people, question them, uh, and immediately after tactical questioning, uh, try to determine who's the most uh, complicit and then uh, release quite a few. And so it was, it was certainly um, noted that the way you treat people, you know, if you're going to treat five people poorly, you're going to release four people back into the population. Um, you don't want to create four enemies right away. Uh, and that's something that, you know, much has been said about the uh, counterinsurgency manual. But um, one of the things that's talked about in the counterinsurgency manual is insurgent math. Um, when you do operations uh, in insurgent math, uh, you don't want to create more insurgents by the way you act. And that's certainly in both the detention and then in the tactical questioning uh, and, and when you release folks. Um, so again, you're, you, you're outstripped by your ability to hold everybody who uh, you might think is guilty. Um, so you want to try to get to the most guilty. And so then because of that, you really, you're driven to an evidence-based uh, detention more than anything. Um, and then as you look forward to the expiration of the UNSCR, uh, you're also driven to evidence-based detention because you know you're going to transfer the, these uh, detainees that you hold to the government of Iraq, and the government of Iraq is going to uh, do something with them under their criminal laws on a human rights uh, law basis. And so, um, so what we started to do then started to look quite a bit like um, HRL-based uh, detention. And we started to, and we also saw that when we had 25,000 people in detention and we uh, eventually let people out, um, what we didn't want to create was a terrorist university in those detention um, places like Camp Buka. And at one time it had been a terrorist university. So what we really needed to do was think counterinsurgency within the detention population as well. Uh, and so we started to talk about those other four goals I, I talked about before. You know, how do we rehabilitate some of the people who are inside the, counter, inside the detention facility so when they are released? How do, we, um, how do we ensure that there are guarantors out in the society? Can they be released back in their village and in their village uh, they can, you know, there's gonna be somebody there who will um, accept them and ensure that they don't engage in behavior in the, in the future. And so those are the types of things that we were uh, trying to do. And, and you, you saw then Task Force 134 who was stood up who did quite a bit of that and put on what was called uh, uh, detention review boards by other names um, where they had people appear, um, talk about uh, the way that they acted within the detention facility. Um, what their links were back in the home community, who could guarantee their conduct there, uh, and that ended up being very useful. Again, it started to look a lot like a criminal procedure, though, rather than an IHL procedure. Um, but it was done for a counterinsurgency purpose uh, rather than as required or mandated by IHL, I think, at that point. Um, and then once we got to 1 January 2009, um, we were then under uh, only what, what authority was given us by the government of Iraq. And the government of Iraq had told us that we could hold detainees at their request under their law. And then we could only conduct operations um, pursuant to their law. So we, it, was all, it went from intelligence-based operations, 
to warrant-based operations where you'd have to go to an Iraqi judge with your intelligence, uh, with your Iraqi partners, um, and, and get a, a warrant for the arrest to go uh, detain somebody after 1 January 2009. Now, that was a, a, good, a very good thing in many ways because um, what was good about it is up until 1 January 2009, uh, most of the Iraqi judges felt in many ways they didn't have to act. You know, the Americans would act. You know, if there's a bad guy living down the street, there's bad guys in our neighborhood, well, eventually the Americans will act because, uh, um, because they, they always have. But as of 1 January, they came to know that we weren't going to act and that they actually had to uh, execute a warrant. So um, they, and, and we were skeptical that they were going to do that. But in fact, they, they did. Um, and they started to show how vested they were in the future of the government of Iraq. So. Um, so I guess I just, you know, before, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's after lunch and Howard Coe was brilliant and riveting. Um, and I think that I might fall asleep before my, I stop talking. I don't know, uh, more, uh, that probably is as, uh, likely as, uh, you falling asleep. But I, I guess I just end by saying, um, what we were trying to do in Iraq in 2008 in building in all these HRL-like um, processes was in many ways modeling for the Iraqis and then in building their institutions and being able to transition uh, to them so that they could uh, comply with their own uh, human rights law obligations and their own um, host nation laws. And I think that you'll see that, you see that right now in Afghanistan. Uh, the things that Task Force 435 are doing. Um, and, and I've seen some recent reports where uh, reporters have been brought in or, or members of organizations to watch some of the detainee review board processes. And there have been complaints about, well, you know, there's a personal representative, but they should have an attorney. They have a right to an attorney at these detainee review boards. Well, I think um, uh, that that is a, a view that I think doesn't comport with the fact that, you know, where we are in the legal paradigm there in Afghanistan right now. It is. It is aspirational uh, for where we would want Afghanistan to be um, and where we hope to be one day, but it is not where we are right now. Um, and, and I would just close with a story in uh, the closing days of Iraq of, uh, of some, a case that's gotten some notoriety, and that's of a, a Lieutenant Behenna. A Lieutenant Behenna was a platoon leader um, who his platoon had, had undergone an IED. One of his platoon members was, was killed. He felt you know, personally responsible uh, for that loss of his platoon. Uh, they did some work. They got who they thought was, had, had, uh, was responsible for that IED. And they went and they detained him. Uh, they detained him and as was proper procedure at that point, he was then shipped off to uh, Camp Buka, the, the main place. He was interrogated. Uh, he was held for 14 days. Um, but the evidence was not really there to, to be able to transition him. Again, this is in the closing days of 2008, to be able to transition that case to a criminal case. And so um, the, the member was returned to the platoon to uh, have him returned to either the point of capture or to his home village. And Lieutenant Behenna um, took the platoon as, on a detour through the, through the desert he stopped his, his vehicles. He told everybody, wait here, I'm just gonna let him go here. We're close enough to the village, I'm gonna let him go here. He brought him down into a culvert and Lieutenant Behenna uh, shot the Iraqi um, civilian uh, while he was uh, flex cuffed. And shot him in the head and killed him. And um, then went back to the platoon and said, oh, he's, he's gone, you know, he took off, we're good to go. Now what happened in that case was uh, platoon members started to realize, wait, are we sure that he showed up? And, uh, and, and actually the platoon members eventually reported on their lieutenant that they don't think uh, that actually this guy got back to his village. Turns out later a body was found and Lieutenant Behenna was eventually convicted and he was given a 25 year sentence. Um, and so when you have force in this position, I mean, you know, there's two sides of that coin. Obviously the Iraqi citizen would much rather be detained for till the end of hostilities than be killed in a situation like that. And, and there's no excuse for what Lieutenant Behenna did. Um, but Lieutenant Behenna 
I think as we think about operators in this situation, as they, as they transition from an IHL detention to an HRL, uh, you know, they feel very responsible for their soldiers, and we have to be very careful about the positions that we put them in. Um, we obviously still, that doesn't mean that we don't demand discipline and we don't uh, follow up and prosecute when they do not, um, when they act in a way in which Lieutenant Bahena did. Uh, and we will continue to do that as the United States Army. But, uh, but we still, as, as academicians, and as we think about this, these legal problems, I think we have to worry about the practical aspects of uh, the policies that are put in place. So I look forward to your questions, and uh, I, I know that um, whatever policy um, implications there are to any of the questions, uh, certainly Bill will answer rather than me anyway. Uh, thank you, General Ayers. Um, Lieutenant Commander Covet. Hi. And uh, this is my pleasure to come here and uh, speak in front of uh, all of you over here. And uh, I'm going to tell the story about Thailand and how we struggle with the problem of uh, non-international armed conflict. Thailand is not uh, new. We used to have, we used to struggle with the problem of uh, asymmetric warfare, non-international armed conflict, and back in, during the Cold War, we start to fight with the Communist Party in Thailand. We used to facing with the armed force uh, who work very well organized and uh, fight nearly going to be the civil war in Thailand. That is during the Cold War. We have to learn how to use the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. We have to start to learn how to dealing with this kind of thing. We have to learn about how to detain or interrogate or of this kind of person. That kind of thing happened and end in nearly 10 years. It happened back in 1975, something like that, and uh, it lasts long for nearly 10 years. After we finish the war with the communists in Thailand, we start to have uh, the problem with the border clash between Thai, Myanmar, and Thai, and Laos, also, Thai and Cambodia still stuck with this kind of thing like now. Actually, Thailand is a member of the four Geneva Convention. We ratified this four convention back in 1949. And uh, from that period of time, the law of armed conflict have played a significant role for the loyal Thai armed force. We have to learn how to do, how to use our force, how to practice our people to identify the belligerent, how to identify the soldier and the civilian. We have a lot of questions about do we need to use the Geneva Convention during the border cash? Is the common Article 3 going to apply? Or if we have some form of internal incident, like insurgency, that kind, those kind of thing, do we have to apply this common article three? That question has been asked several times, and we have been questioned by our own people about what military have done. The information that I'm going to give to you, this is the definition of the detention in Thai. And I translate that into the English. And you will see that is uh, really similar to the concept of a detention for all around the world. It's the some form of the safety measure. You have to detain on the ground to make yourself feel safe, to make the society safe. And that is the point for the detention. And on this point, 
we train our armed force about the law of war and uh, how to detain under international humanitarian law. But that kind of thing changed rapidly. Start from 2000, we start to have the riot. We start to have the insurgency in Bangkok. We start to have that kind of uh, insurgency group and transnational crime in the southern part of Thailand. Whatever you call the act of uh, um, aggression in the southern part of Thailand. You can call that terrorist, you can call that any kind of thing, but Thai government call it insurgency. We call it that kind of uh, criminal activity that caused the problem to national security. We also have the problem with the piracy. When we send the warship to the Somalia Gulf, the Gulf of Aden, we struggle with how to detain the piracy. Do we have the right to interrogate them on board the Thai vessel? And even how to hand all the piracy? The manual, such kind of thing, we don't have the manual for the handover manual. We don't have any agreement with the Kenya. We don't have any kind of that thing. We have to keep them on board of our Thai warship. And is it possible to detain those pilots on board the warship? Is it appropriate to do so? And when you come to the term of uh, detention, you will realize that for the kind of uh, operation like the pilot, in the Somalia. When you deter this lab, you capture the pilot and you take them on board, that is probably the best way to keep them away from the chance to make another attack. We already learned that if you put them back on board the vessel or the small boat and send them out to the sea, less than a day or two, they're going back to do the same business again. They start to attack the ship inside this, the operation area again, even further aggression. This is the most important point. You probably still need to have the detained power, detention power, to keep that or those suspect criminal for the safety of another person. And we all agree that we should have that kind of thing. During the law enforcement and operation for the protection of Thai national security, Thailand have to rely on our own constitution, Thai internal legal system, human rights law, and the ICCPR. We are the member of uh, the ICCPR. And we have to train all the force that we send to operate in the southern part of Thailand and try to fight with the, some form of inter insurgency and the lie of with the knowledge of the human life and the lie of the suspect. One of the main problem in the southern part of Thailand is how you can detain them and if you have this guy, those guy, those people, where are you going to put these people in? Are you going to interrogate? Do you have the right to interrogate them? This is all the question the military have to facing with. Normally, the definition of the belligerent and the party in war is uh, have been asking by most of the Thai citizens, are we in the war-like situation in the southern part of Thailand? Are we in the armed conflict situation in the southern part of Thailand? And after the Thai government study carefully about this, the situation in the southern part of Thailand is not diving by the Islamic extremism. 
or is does not diving by the jihad or any kind of that such activity is the political diving force that put the problem into the three provinces in the southern part of Thailand. And that is make we realize about the situation. We have to change our own mind. The first time we think that we should declare this the terrorist, and we should follow the US by declaring the war on the terrorist. But after we realize that this is the political purpose and uh, it's just the minor group of the people. It's not the jihad, it's not the Islamic extremism. And we just realize that we should dealing with this kind of situation just internally. And we treat them like the criminal and transnational criminal. Especially, we never use the international humanitarian law in the southern part of Thailand. The common article three never apply in the southern part of Thailand. But we do use the human life and the ICCPR regulation in the southern part of Thailand. All of us over here have no exactly the ICCPR does not deny the necessity and the right of the state to protect its own national security in the time of public emergency, which threaten to the life of the nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed. And that means if you have the law which said this kind of activity is illegal, is harm to the national security, then you can just use the internal law to dealing with that. Under the law of nation, criminal activity that threaten the life of person may criminally prosecute. And when you prosecute them, you have to keep them for, you have to detain them for a period of time to seek the evidence. And under Article 135 or 135 of a Thai criminal procedure court, we already, the Thai law already suggests that the interlocation and execute in acquire all the information should not perform by the act of torture or abuse, or any other unlawful mean. Moreover, the loyal Thai armed force also comply with the spirit of the common article, even we don't have to, by putting this term into the, our law of engagement in the southern part of Thailand. We guarantee the right for the person who engage in this kind of activity when they lay down their weapon, we do not murder them, we do not torture, we give the treatment, we do not take the hostage, and we do exactly what the common article three suggests. Us. In Thailand, we have another three internal legal system that's dealing with the situation in the southern part of Thailand. Uh, the legal system that we use to dealing with this kind of activity is the martial law, the emergency decree and internal security act. And this is really interesting when you come with these three law in the same area, how you using these three law in the same area, how you start to use them. 
the martial law for the military power to dealing with this kind of situation. If you decide this situation is really dangerous and you go for the military, you have the right to detain for seven days without any court approval. Just keep them and lock them out for seven days and find all the evidence. If you cannot find any evidence during that seven day, you have to release them. And that is Thai martial law. The emergency decree also give the detention power to the police with the court approval for the seven day detention, but not over than 30 day. You have the right to detain them for seven day to find any evidence related to their criminal activity. If you cannot find, you can extend for another seven day, but not over than 30. If you meet that limit, you have to release them. And that is what we do. Normally, the Thai government prefer to use emergency decree more than using the martial law to cope with the kind of situation in the southern part of Thailand. The most notable detention power is come from Internal Security Act, which gives the power to the court for sending to the detention camp six months. You can send them to detaining camp for six months to detain the person who suspect to commit the crime against Thai national security. We are not allowed the detention outside the national terrority because this is cause us the problem with investigation and the jurisdiction. We have to take them to detain them inside our own nation only. We cannot send them to back to Malaysia. We cannot send, send them back to Indonesia even they have uh, such a national. We have to keep them because the Thai constitution said we have to execute and prosecute the crime against Thai national security inside Thailand. Interrogation of the detainee have to comply with Article 135 of uh, Thai Criminal Procedure Code, which I told you that uh, you have to respect to the human and you have to avoid detention, uh, avoid some form of uh, torture and uh, abuse. In the conclusion, Thailand does not view transnational crime as a normal part of the armed conflict. But later, the illegal activity which fall under the criminal. The use of force against such activity is not considered a military operation, but only the law enforcement in Thai perspective. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Kovit. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to uh, Mr. Uh, Dorman. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks a lot very much to, uh, to Dennis for keep on inviting me to, to this event. It's really a privilege to be here and apologize that a, a couple of times I bailed out at the last minute, but I'm glad to be here for your final session. In any case, thanks a lot for that. We appreciate, uh, as usual, the, uh, the invitations to the ICSC that we can share our reading of, um, of current issues with um, with regard to international humanitarian law. We appreciate obviously as well that sometimes criticism is uh, expressed with regard to positions that we take, as we know from DPH. But um, the good thing is that uh, we launch at least uh, some debate and as we heard from, uh, from Steve Pomper, it engages and also states to, uh, to, uh, to sharpen perhaps their analysis of, uh, of the issue and come to, uh, to uh, to common positions. In any case, thanks a lot for that. What I propose to do now in the in the 20 minutes or so, and based on what the organizers have asked me to do, um, it's to uh, to uh, talk a little bit about the applicable legal framework to detention in non-international armed conflicts, and particularly to focus on the interplay of international humanitarian law and uh, human rights law. I will do it by uh, passing in review the different categories of rules that would apply so conditions, treatment, uh, fair trial guarantees, and then also procedural safeguards in security detention. 
And at the same time, I will share as well um, the ICSC's analysis with regard to uh, the potential need to strengthen the law in that domain. And I will, after each category, a category of, uh, of rules, uh, make some points on that. Uh, let me start by doing some general observations on uh, the sources of law in non-international armed conflict when it comes to uh, detention. Um, as we have heard a couple of times, it's uh, obviously common Article 3 uh, that, that applies uh, specifically to all persons that are, that are deprived of liberty. Status of persons is not an issue. It's, uh, it's a gen generic reference to all persons that uh, do not take any more an active part in hostilities or find themselves in, in detention. The same is true for the rules that come from additional Protocol 2, the Articles 4 to, to 6, where fundamental guarantees, then specific rules on deprivation of liberty, and then uh, more the criminal uh, part of detention. Given the limited number of rules that we have in these articles, you can appreciate that obviously custom international law becomes also quite relevant in non-international armed conflicts. But also linked to the paucity um, of, of rules in non-international armed conflict, the question arises, and that's why I talk about it as well, whether international humanitarian law needs to be developed in that field of, of law. Human rights law, as we have heard already a couple of times, uh, it is generally accepted despite some important dissenters, including the US, that, uh, that human rights law applies as well alongside international humanitarian law in armed conflicts, and it also applies extraterritorially. What is, however, not really settled is how you, um, uh, how you detail exactly the interplay between the two branches of law in, in, uh, in different cases, and also the exact extent of the uh, extraterritorial application of human rights law. I think in general terms, one, what can, one can say that when it comes to international armed conflicts, obviously international humanitarian law is the leg specialis, but the situation in non-international armed com conflicts is certainly more complex. And two issues I think are particularly important to keep in mind. The first one is when it comes to uh, obligations under human rights law, obviously these obligations are not shared obligations because they only bind state actors and not uh, the non-state party in a non-international armed conflict, at least in accordance with a really overwhelming theory and probably uh, also the overwhelming view of states. Um, international humanitarian law, therefore, is clearly and remains the indispensable legal framework in non-international armed conflicts because it is the only body of international law that is aimed at the protection of persons that clearly binds both parties to an armed conflict, so state and non-state uh, parties in an armed conflict. And international humanitarian law would also be the only uh, international branch or international law that, uh, that would apply when you have a non-international armed conflict which, which uh, purely takes place between non-state armed groups. The second issue, um, it's really the, uh, the, the crucial issue, how you determine the interplay between international humanitarian law and human rights uh, treaty law obligations. This is clearly the most difficult endeavor. And therefore, it's not sufficient just to have broad statements uh, that say that international humanitarian, uh, human rights law continues to apply in armed conflict without further elaborating on what it means in practice. Situations of armed conflict cannot be equated to times of peace, and some international humanitarian law and human rights uh, rules produce conflicting results when applied to the same situation because they simply reflect a different reality that each body of law was primarily developed for. And we have heard a couple of examples already during this conference, in particular when it comes to the use of force, uh, the different interpretations of, of, the, uh, of the rule of proportionality in human rights law, and then in international humanitarian law is uh, just one example. Um, and that means, in fact, that uh, the relationship between uh, international humanitarian law and, um, and human rights law must be determined really on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and in particular when it comes to, uh, to the, the law on detention in non-international armed conflicts. And one aspect uh, that is particularly relevant in this regard, and I will come uh, back to it at the end, is uh, procedural safeguards um, for security detention. Deprivation of liberty, and now I'm go going a little bit more into the specifics of, uh, of the applicable rules. Uh, deprivation of liberty is an inevitable and lawful incidence of armed conflict, including, of course, in non-international armed conflicts. It is not stated that explicitly in, uh, in uh, Common Article 3 or in uh, Additional Protocol 2, but by referring to internment and detention, uh, it is uh, clearly supposed that uh, this will happen on either side of a non-international armed conflict. 
The basic principle as stipulated by common article three, whenever, whenever it comes to, uh, to detention, the law applicable to detention is humane treatment. Um, and if you divide then more broadly uh, the, the different rules that apply to detention, um, as I mentioned before, you, you will start first with um, the, the rules on treatment of detainees in the, in the narrow sense. And there we have all the norms in common article three, article four of, uh, of additional protocol two, which deal with the protection of the physical and mental integrity and the well-being of persons deprived of liberty for whatever reason. And you all know the, the, the examples, they are the prohibition of murder, torture, or other forms of cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment, mutilation, medical or scientific experiments, as well as other forms of violence to life and health, including also rape and, uh, and other sexual uh, violence. All of these acts, one can say, are uh, prohibited by international humanitarian law and in the same way also by human rights law. Therefore, the interplay does not really matter that much. With regard to this particular category of rules applicable in non-international armed conflict, one can say that really existing law is sufficiently strong and that no further, further elaboration uh, is, is really required there. What is much more of concern based on uh, what we see as ICSD delegates in the field is really respect for these rules, which should be uncontroversial, which should be un unambiguous, but still most of the humanitarian problems are caused because of non-respect of these rules. When we talk again still um, treatment of persons, you could also add to that category of rules um, the situation of transfer of detainees, which may lead to a violation of life to right, uh, uh, right to life or the prohibition of torture or other ill treatment. Um, transfer of detainees obviously um, raises quite important legal and uh, practical problems in current armed conflicts to a certain extent. We have heard about it. The ICSC views has been consistently that the principle of non refoulement must be observed whenever a person might be transferred from one authority to another and when there's a risk that a transferred per, um, person, a detainee, uh, might be subject to arbitrary deprivation of life, which would include as well imposition of a death penalty after an unfair trial, uh, when there's a risk that, uh, that torture or other forms of ill treatment happen, when there's a risk of enforced disappearance and uh, of persecution. There are obviously no explicit international humanitarian rules in, uh, in any treaty law applicable to non-international armed conflicts. However, it may be argued, and that is uh, certainly one line of, uh, of argument that we have always used, that it would contravene the explicit prohibitions of common article three if a party transferred an individual under its control or authority to another party if there are substantial grounds to believe that the person would be tortured or otherwise ill-treated or arbitrarily deprived of life. In our view, however, in light of the lack of specific specificity in, uh, in treaty law applicable to non-international armed conflicts, one should at least debate and consider whether uh, the existing um, uh, treaty law should be, uh, should be strengthened or the, the existing framework should be strengthened and uh, in particular dis discussing also issues related to responsibilities of parties after, uh, after a transfer whenever there, there are information about um, violations of the, the prohibitions of torture or ill treatment and, and so forth. So really to discuss how best to organize an appropriate transfer <laughs> A regime including the post-transfer responsibilities. We have examples coming obviously from uh, international armed conflicts with regard to Article 12 apl applicable to, to prisons of war and we have the same also with regard to uh, civilian internees, uh, or enemy, uh, aliens in enemy territory, Article 45 in the First uh, Geneva Convention. Now the second set of rules that, uh, that is relevant when it comes to, uh, to detention in non-international armed conflicts, um, material conditions of detention. And here the purpose of the rules is clearly uh, to ensure that the detaining authorities adequately provide for detainees uh, physical and psychological needs, which means that, uh, that food, accommodation, health, hygiene, contacts with the outside world, religious observance and others are uh, ensured. Treaty and customary international law, uh, international humanitarian law provide a substantial catalog, a catalog of standards pertaining to conditions of detention for international armed conflicts. Um, but also to a, to a lesser extent in non-international armed conflicts as well as you have certain standards that come from soft law instruments um, of, uh, of human rights law. So one could certainly derive a common body of law from, from these sources. And in the absence of more specificity really in the treaty law of non-international armed conflict, 
probably these standards could could serve as a as a proper guidance when uh, uh, when uh, conducting uh, detention uh, operations. However, given again the paucity of uh, of the rules in non-international armed conflict, we also believe that states should uh, should consider strengthening the normative framework, in particular in this regard, and related to that, give a, spe a specific focus on uh, the poss uh, possible or more specific rules with regard to particularly vulnerable groups, so women, children, the elderly, or disabled, so, uh, that may have uh, specific needs in detention uh, situations. And we believe really, based on what we see in, uh, in a multitude of detention facilities that we visit worldwide, that if we could come to a strengthening of the normative framework, that probably quite a lot of the humanitarian problems that we witness could be uh, could be remedied at least to a, to a certain extent. The third uh, set of rules, fair trial rights. And here we are talking really about criminal detention. And um, it's clear that, uh, that persons detained on suspicion of having committed a criminal offense are entitled to fair trial guarantees. Um, the list of fair trial guarantees, one could say, is quite identical between international humanitarian law and, uh, and uh, human rights law. Obviously, Common Article 3 does not contain a list. But uh, we would submit that uh, uh, the, the guarantees that are contained in Article 70, 75 of Additional Protocol 1 constitute custom international law that would also be applicable in non-international armed conflicts. And in fact, uh, they essentially encapsulate also uh, the guarantees that are contained in Article 6, uh, Paragraph 5 of Additional Protocol uh, 2, which applies in non-international armed conflicts. And in that respect, one can even say that international humanitarian law reinforces human rights law because it is obviously uh, you cannot derogate from the obligations that come from international humanitarian law. The fourth set of rules, and this is probably the, the key challenge, I guess, in, uh, in uh, modern detention operations, that's uh, procedural safeguards in uh, security operations. And this, this is so crucial in terms of making sure that, uh, that detention or internment does not end up uh, to constitute arbitrary deprivation of, uh, of liberty. So when I talk about internment, um, we would uh, define it as a non-criminal detention of a person based on a serious threat uh, that his or her activity poses to the security of the detaining authority in an armed conflict. Um, and this area of law is probably the, the one uh, where most of the differences emerge in international humanitarian law applicable in international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict, and also the differences between international humanitarian law and human rights law, and where possibly also the most important gaps with regard to international humanitarian law in non-international armed conflicts exist. So when you look again, as, as I've said, at the, at the treaty regulations, there's nothing in, uh, in uh, either Common Article 3 or um, Additional Protocol 2 that, um, that deals with procedural safeguards. Internment is simply mentioned and is, uh, given, uh, is, is uh, detailed as a, as a given, but nothing more specific is, um, is presented in terms of grounds for detention or in terms of process that needs to be uh, followed. In a traditional non-international armed conflict, the classical one which happens uh, within the territory of a single state between government armed forces and, uh, and um, uh, more, one or more non-state armed groups. Domestic law, informed by human rights law and international humanitarian law, uh, constitutes the legal framework governing the deprivation of liberty by the state and uh, of non-state armed actors. So what does it mean in terms of state obligations in particular when it comes to, uh, to, to human rights obligations? And there, I guess, there are, there are differences of, of views, what, uh, what, it, uh, what is really the, the situation. We have some views. Uh, that would say that uh, domestic law cannot allow non-criminal detention in armed conflict without derogation from the ICCPR, even if the state provided judicial review as required under Article 9.4 of, uh, of the Covenant. Then other views that, ex uh, that express the, uh, the opinion that derogation would be necessary if the state suspended the right to habeas corpus and provided only administrative review of internment in a non-international armed conflict in the way as it is foreseen in, uh, in international armed conflicts uh, based on the, on the forced Geneva Convention. And then still you have other positions uh, that claim that the right to habeas corpus can never be derogated from. And an, uh, this is an approach we would submit that is really not practical in a situation in a non, uh, of a non-international armed conflict. We have heard uh, the numbers of 20, 25,000 people that, that were detained and uh, if you would have full-fledged habeas corpus proceeding there, it would certainly um, be 
quite problematic in a, in a conflict situation. Um, identifying the legal framework governing internment is in our view even more complex when you are in two other forms of non-international armed conflicts we have discussed about these types a couple of times, what we would call in particular multinational non-international armed conflicts. So you have a coalition of, of, um, of states, of armed forces that are fighting alongside uh, a host government against, uh, against non-state actors in, uh, in, their, in their territory and also non-international armed conflicts in which UN forces or forces under the aegis of a regional organization are sent uh, to help stabilize a host government involved in hostilities against one or more organization, uh, organized armed groups in its territory, AMISOM or MONUSCO could be, uh, could be cases there. The questions, and I will just flag them, that, that arise in terms of um, uncertainties with regard to human rights obligations. The first one, I, I repeat it, is obviously when you have in this coalition states that, uh, that do reject the applicability of human rights law in, uh, in armed conflict situation. We have heard about the US position. We have heard from, uh, from Charles Garraway that at least when you're uh, fighting with, uh, with allies that have accepted human rights obligations also extraterritorially in such a situation, uh, you should be aware of the, the constraints that, that exist there, but still um, there, are, there are questions that arise. The second issue, you may have different um, human rights obligations uh, in, the, in the same uh, coalition, so how do you deal with this? Uh, the third one is the reach, uh, the extraterritorial reach of human, um, of human rights law. How far does it go? We have statements coming also from the, uh, from the International uh, Court of Justice and the Human Rights uh, Committee that have opined that states carry their human rights obligations when they act abroad. But these statements, are they really sufficient in order to, uh, to explicit uh, the reach, uh, the, 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 the exact reach of the human rights obligations? You look at litigation that is going on at the European Court of Human Rights. They have been very clear that, that also the, the prohibition of torture and ill treatment is something that, uh, that must be respected also extraterritorially in, in detention operations. The extent to which procedural safeguards must be, uh, must be uh, complied with and which ones, this is something that is still subject to litigation and it would probably even be more complex when it comes to, uh, to aspects on the use of force uh, uh, extraterritorially. The fourth issue that, um, that uh, needs um, further discussion and clarity is um, that thus far no judicial or other body has opined on whether states must derogate from their human rights obligations in order to detain persons abroad without providing habeas corpus. Um, if the application of human rights law is to be applied to the battlefield reality in which providing judicial review in thousands or tens of thousands of cases may not be feasible, it would appear that a derogation should be enacted. What remains unresolved is which state has to derogate from the obligations. Is it the, the, the state operating externally or is it the host state in, under these circumstances? The fifth question that, uh, that arises in such type of situations is related to, uh, to the effect of, uh, of a Chapter 7 UN Security Council resolution. Um, there, what one can see is that views are a bit divided on whether a Chapter 7 resolution authorizing a multinational force to use all necessary means to fulfill its mandate may be read as permitting internment. While there are obviously good reason to believe that it may, if the mission can obviously um, uh, um, entail the use of force, then you could say that would entail also the entitlement, entitlement to intern. However, there are also other voices who say that uh, this, this kind of formulation is not sufficiently precise to, uh, to, uh, to comply with the principle of legality. So let me uh, just recap a little bit what the ICC has been doing on this core in, uh, in, uh, uh, with regard to procedural safeguards in detention. Really, as a, uh, as a reaction in particular to the paucity of international humanitarian law in non-international armed conflicts with regard to the rules on procedural safeguards in, uh, in non-international armed conflicts, but also um, in, uh, in light of the fairly rudimentary nature of the process due to civilians in international armed conflicts, we have uh, issued some institutional guidelines in uh, 2005 entitled Procedural Principles on Safeguards for Internment, Administrative Detention in Armed Conflict and Other Situations of Violence. These rules or these guidelines that we have issued are based on, uh, on law and policy and are, are largely based on concepts that come also from, 
uh, from international humanitarian law uh, applicable in international armed conflict, in particular the Fourth Geneva Convention, which deals with security detention. And we have formulated them in a way that, uh, that these, uh, these guidelines can be applied in a manner that takes into account really the specific cases or the, the specific situations at hand. Um, and these guidelines we have been relying on really in a, on a regular basis in our operational dialogue with uh, state authorities in, in a multitude of, uh, of uh, operations. And here I would just like to dwell on two particular points um, from, from these guidelines. It's one, grants for, uh, for security detention and then also the rules or the process that, uh, that, is, uh, that should be put in place whenever it comes to uh, security detention. Again, nothing of this is uh, specifically spelled out in non-international armed conflicts. So grounds uh, for internment, the ICSC has relied on, uh, as a standard on imperative reasons of security as the minimum legal standard that should inform internment decisions in all situations of violence, including non-international armed conflicts. This policy choice was adopted because it emphasizes the exceptional nature of internment and is already in wide use also in, in state practice. You have referred as well to, to the security standards from, uh, from Iraq that have been applied. It seems also to be the appropriate standard in multinational, non-international armed conflicts in which foreign forces are detaining non-nationals in the territory of the host state as the wording is based on the internment standard applicable in occupied territories under the Force Geneva Convention. It is believed uh, that the proposed standard stri strikes a workable balance between the need to protect um, personal liberty and the detaining authorities' need to, uh, to protect against activities seriously prejudicial to its uh, security. Now, we, there should be no, no controversy that direct participation in hostilities is an activity that would meet the imperative uh, reasons of the security standard. The key issue is, of course, how you define direct participation in hostilities, and uh, it will not surprise you that we are we are not necessarily taking a broad view as some, some others may do, but um, this um, is probably not the point here to discuss. And con uh, on the other hand side, internment uh, may not be resorted to for the sole purpose of interrogation or intelligence gathering unless the person in question is deemed to represent a, ser a, security, a serious security threat based on his or her uh, activity. Similarly, internment may not be resorted to in order to punish a person for past activity. As a general matter, internment should not be used in view of criminal prosecution when an effective judicial system is in fact available. In all cases, it must be recognized that the imperative reasons of security standard is high and careful evaluation of whether it has been and uh, has been met must take place in relation to each person uh, that is detained. I would have some doubts, and this was one question that Eric has, has raised as well, whether the material support standard is really something that, uh, that would comply uh, with, uh, with imperative security threat standard that comes from international humanitarian law. As regards um, the internment review, the ICSC guidelines provide that uh, persons must inter alia be informed promptly uh, in a language he or she understands of the reasons for internment and also of the right to challenge um, the lawfulness of his or internment with, uh, with the least possible delay before an independent impartial body. And if you, in practice you want to, mon uh, to mount such a challenge um, to, uh, to the, uh, with regard to the legality of detention, it is crucial in our view that, um, that any detention regime uh, provides uh, procedural and practical steps, including providing internees with sufficient evidence supporting the allegations against them, ensuring that procedures are in place to enable internees uh, to seek and obtain uh, additional evidence, and uh, making sure that internees understand the various stages of the internment review process and the process as a whole. Where internment review is administrative rather than judicial in nature, ensuring the requisite independence and impartial impartiality of the rebody will require particular attention. Um, the other part, very important as well, the, uh, the detention um, regime uh, should foresee then also periodical review to a certain whether the detainee continues to pose a security threat. To conclude um, on uh, this, uh, this, uh, this tour d'horizon on, on the law applicable to detention, one can see that there is certainly an important body of law that governs detention in non-international armed conflicts based sometimes on a complex interplay between international humanitarian law and human rights law. 
but I think what's also evident is that there is uh, there are certain gaps in the in the law applicable to uh, to detention in non-international armed conflict, and that's in fact the reason why uh, the ICRC came to the conclusion after after its internal study on uh, whether there are particular gaps in in the law um, and, uh, in, and whether there are particular humanitarian problems that are not sufficiently addressed in existing law, that detention should be one of the areas where states should discuss whether the legal framework needs to be strengthened. I'm happy to, uh, to explain a little bit further on, on the whole process uh, of our internal analysis in this regard and what other pro uh, proposals we have made. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>